Redeemer is a church that was founded on prayer. In the 1980s, our denomination's Women in the Church Committee organized hundreds of women's groups from around the country to pray for me, my wife Kathy, and our three young boys as we followed God's call to plant a church in New York City. More than 25 years later, the fruit of those prayers is extraordinary, certainly beyond anything we imagined. Yet now we sense God calling us into something even bigger in what we're calling the RISE Campaign. It's a vision for New York City that includes launching hundreds of new churches, the building of a new church space that is more rooted in our local community, and training hundreds of leaders for ministry both inside and outside the church. As we follow God's lead, will you pray for us? I'm confident we cannot succeed without your prayers and would be honored if you would join me and thousands of our friends around the world in a special day of prayer on Saturday, April 16th. We're praying for the gospel movement already underway in our city and for God to accelerate this movement through the RISE campaign over the next 10 years. Please visit rise.redeemer.com slash rise and pray to sign up to pray with us on April 16th. Today's scripture comes from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go and said to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. If you got a letter in the mail from a law firm, you know, on very official looking law firm stationery, and it said that some distant relative that you had never heard of, didn't know about, had died and had left you millions of dollars, uh, it's likely you would have been, you'd be very skeptical. It seems like there's more scams today than ever, than ever. And this didn't come to you through social media, it didn't come through your phone, but still, uh, you know, so you're very skeptical, but you'd look into it. You, you, you wouldn't just throw it away. Why? Because the offer is just too much, too great not to at least look into it. Well, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is just like that. You could be really, really skeptical about it. But the offer, the resurrection of Jesus Christ does not just offer some kind of uh, vague, immaterial, ethereal afterlife of some sort. It offers you a new body, 
uh, in a renewed, perfect world with loved ones, with walking with God, it's actually, I don't care how skeptical you are, you just can't not look into it. And there's no better way to do that than actually this, this particular passage because it shows that the resurrection of Jesus Christ offers you something intensely rational, merciful, personal, and wonderful. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a remarkable package. It offers you something rational, incredibly intensely rational, and yet merciful, and yet personal and wonderful. Here's what I mean by rational. Uh, Mary Magdalene finds the tomb empty, runs and tells Peter, uh, and the apostle that is never named in the book of John, but most everyone thinks is John himself. So Peter and the other disciples start running to the tomb. Uh, John gets there first. He bends over and looks at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Simon Peter comes along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in place, separate from the linen. Now, what's going on here? The, when, when it says that Peter goes in there and saw, it's not the normal Greek word for see, blepo. It's the word that you actually would recognize. It's a Greek word that's used there, theoreo, from which we get our word theorize. And it's a word that means to observe something intently looking for an explanation, which, by the way, is, is essentially rationality. You're looking at evidence. You're looking at something and you're thinking. In fact, even the way it's uh, described here shows that Peter was thinking. Wait a minute. Uh, he was probably thinking something like this. Okay, now wait. If, if normal grave robbers took the body, why in the world would they have left behind the linen with all the, with the, with all the valuable spices in them? And f in fact, why would you also uh, take away the stuff that keeps the body from smelling? Well, grave robbers wouldn't have done that. On the other hand, if disciples had done that, why would they dishonor the body by taking it away naked? Wait a minute, what's going on? He's thinking. He's reasoning. And so is John. And at the, at the end, finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went inside. He saw and believed. Now, what's actually going on here is they are furiously thinking. Why do I point this up, out? because many people think today that if you're a Christian, you've just decided to believe. You know, some people are more rational and they think about things and they want proof, but Christians are people who just decide they want to believe. Well, you're going to see here in, a, in one second that it took a great deal of evidence, a whole lot of reasoning for the disciples to believe, and that is how Christian faith works. If your Christian faith is not shot through with all sorts of reasoning and thinking. It'll never last through the ups and downs of life in this world. Christian faith is obviously more than reasoning and thinking, but it's not less. You say, well, fine, they had stuff to look at. They had evidence to look at and to think about and to reason about, but what, we, what, what, what do we have? Well, we've got some evidence too. There's a whole lot, but I only have time to show you two things that are actually here in the text. One of them is Mary Magdalene herself. Uh, Celsus, who was a, uh, an early, a second century early Greek philosopher who hated Christianity. He, was, he wrote one of the first intellectual uh, attacks on Christianity, showing why it was specious and why it didn't work philosophically and why it wasn't true. But, but one of the main avenues for Celsus' attacks on Christianity was Mary Magdalene. And he said, okay, get ready for this, New Yorkers, he said, how can anyone expect rational men to listen to the testimony of a, quote, hysterical female, unquote? Now, why he was able to do that was this. One is, he lived in a time that we would call a misogynist time, a time in which uh, women's um, uh, status was very, very low. Okay. It's also true that every single one of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all say that all of the first witnesses of the risen Jesus Christ were women. And therefore, what Celsus did was absolutely right. Everybody, you, his attack was absolutely expected. It was the Achilles heel at the time. It was the Achilles heel of the uh, uh, 
of the Christian movement. Everybody said, well, wait a minute, how can you expect us to believe that if women were the first witnesses? But it's not the Achilles heel of the, ra the, re the rational, rational basis of Christianity today, is it? You know why? Because historians will say that if you were inventing stories about the resurrection, you never would have put women in there in those days as the first witnesses. So the only historically plausible explanation for why women are in the gospel accounts as the first witnesses, the only plausible historical explanation for that is that they were. There's no other reason to write these accounts that way. And here's what this means. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in a, a, it's a public document written less than 20 years after Jesus Christ had died. He said there were hundreds and hundreds of people who saw the risen Christ. Scores of times. One time, 500 people saw him at once. And Paul said, this is public knowledge, he said in that public document. Uh, these people, are, most of them are still alive. They live in these, this town, this town, this town. Many of these witnesses are still around in the churches. You can go talk to them, go question them. Here's the first bit of evidence, everybody. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who said they saw Jesus Christ. Eyewitnesses, we know that, it's a fact. And here's the second fact. These are people whose lives were radically changed. Radically changed. You notice, for example, Peter and John needed evidence to believe. In fact, Mary needed more than just evidence to believe. She needed to actually see him. Why? You say, weren't these people, they, they were, they're ancient people, and not to, not to be nasty, but they're more, incredu they're more credulous than people were today. They, they believed in miracles and things like that. Look, in the decades before and after Jesus Christ, there were a number of messianic pretenders. There were a number of people who came along and said, uh, I am the Messiah, and I'm going to lead uh, Israel and throw off the yoke of their oppressors. One of them, for example, probably the most famous was, besides Jesus, of course, was Bar Kochba, who, who came along after Jesus. But in virtually every situation, the messianic pretender uprising and they were killed. And the moment that every one of those pretenders were killed, everybody said, whoops, it wasn't the Messiah. Nobody else said, oh, they, maybe he's resurrected. Why? Because the Jews, some Jews believed in the resurrection but they believed it would be for everybody, all the righteous at the end of time. Nobody believed, nobody, no Jew believed that a resurrection in the middle of history by one person ahead of everybody else was possible. Nor did any Jew believe that a human being could be God. And here's what we know. You can see it in John chapter 20, especially you get all the way to the end, where Thomas says, my Lord and my God is that overnight there were, uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of Jewish men and women, overnight, their whole worldview changed. They began to worship a man as God. They began to say there, there was an individual resurrection in the middle of history before everybody else. That never would have occurred to any of them. It was inconceivable to their worldview. But what happened? Evidence, enough evidence, eyewitness evidence. Uh, there's a Japanese writer, Shusaku Endo, who put it like this. If you don't believe in the resurrection, you'll be forced to believe that what did hit the disciples was some other amazing event, different in kind, yet of equal force to its electrifying intensity. Something must have happened to them. Maybe, if you don't believe in the resurrection, you're still going to have to come up with some kind of thing just as amazing, equal force with its, in its electrifying intensity. If we try to explain the changed lives of the early Christians, we may find ourselves making leaps of faith as great as if we believe in the resurrection itself. There's a lot more evidence than that. Go find it. Go think about it. Secondly, and probably more comforting today, is the resurrection is also intensely merciful. Look at what he does with Mary. Look how gentle he is, first of all, with her. He's asking her questions. You know, um, one commentator points out that in spite of the fact that Mary's a very admirable person in so many ways, we love her. Uh, she's so passionate for Christ. Uh, you know, it's, she's obviously more of a lover than Peter and John. She's just weeping, where is he? 
and yet her understanding of Jesus Christ is too small, right? As much as she loves him, she's looking for a dead Jesus. She's looking for a small Jesus. She's looking for a Jesus that her worldview, her human worldview, and her human categories allow. And that is a wonderful rabbi, a wonderful teacher, you know, what a godly man, a miracle worker. But, but her, see, her cultural categories are, keep him too small. Uh, one, and, and Jesus needs to reveal himself to her. Uh, one commentator says, Jesus wanted Mary to recognize that grand as her devotion to him was, her estimate of him was still far too small. You know, he had said he was the light of the world. She'd heard that. He'd said he was the judge who was going to come back and judge the world. He'd said he was going to die and rise. She'd heard all that. But her human categories, uh, you know, just wouldn't let her see who he was. And so he had to come through. Now, how did he come through, everybody? Now, he doesn't, he doesn't return and reveal himself like Superman returns. Because when Superman returns, he saves a jetliner in the middle of a stadium of cheering people. And on TV, millions of people. That's, you know, how a superhero returns, but that's not how Jesus returns. There's no flash. He says, why are you crying? Would you describe for me this person you're looking for? Behold the gentleness of Jesus. He's risen, but he's still gentle. But more than that, this... The, the way the risen Christ meets Mary is in some ways a summary of the, of the whole message of the Bible. You know why? First of all, as much as she loved him and as much as she's an admirable uh, character in the, bo in the book, she never would have found him if he had not come and found her. She was looking for him, but she was looking for a dead Jesus. She was looking for a human Jesus. And she would have never, ever, ever found him unless he came and revealed himself to her. Human faith, everybody, is hum humanly speaking. Human uh, faith is impossible. Humanly speaking, faith is impossible. Only if Jesus Christ breaks through, only if he comes and opens your eyes, even your reasoning, even your reason will go nowhere unless he helps you with it. In some ways, this story of Jesus, the risen Jesus meeting Mary, is, is in a sense the summary of the message of the whole Bible. And what is that? Number one, it's that he has to reveal himself to you because our hearts, our minds are always too small. They're always too, uh, uh, our, our upbringing, the fact we didn't get along with our parents, the fact that we live in this particular culture, the fact that we went to this, this school, everything in our life tries to shrink Jesus and say, he can only be this big. He can only be this big. Only Jesus coming to us can burst those categories. He comes gently, but he comes. But maybe the most telling thing about this passage that tells us uh, that Jesus Christ saves by grace, which is the message of the Bible, God saves by grace, is the fact that he chooses her to be the very first messenger to the world. She's the first person in history to have met the risen Christ and to be told, go and tell everyone else. Now, you know who Mary Magdalene was? Luke chapter 8, verse 2, 3 tells us she had seven demons cast out of her. And whatever you think about that, just remember, if you go to Mark chapter 5, you have a picture of a demoniac. What's a demoniac? These were people who wandered around half naked, talking to themselves, hearing voices, See, crying out, social outcasts, usually basically homeless. And Jesus Christ chooses a woman, not a man, a reformed mental patient, at least, not a pillar of the community, and says, you are my messenger. How much more vivid could Jesus Christ be? How much more, how much more powerful could the message be that Jesus is saying, I do not save on the basis of pedigree, or on moral attainment, or on the base of record. I save you not by your work, but by my work. I don't save people who think they're strong. I save people who know that they're weak. Behold the grace of Jesus Christ. 
Behold the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. Here's one last thing, and it is the last thing. It's not just that Jesus Christ saves by grace, but then he gives himself to us. There's a lot of things that he could have said, and this is intriguing. Here, this is a paradigm here. This is a, Jesus Christ is, is showing the world how he relates to us here. When, how does he reveal himself to her? How does he, he doesn't say, it's me. <laughs> well, why doesn't he do that? I mean, I think every, every, you know, you say, oh, I don't know where he is. I don't know where he is. You know, thinking he's the gardener. He thinks he's the gardener. She thinks he's the gardener. Why does, he doesn't say, it's me. Do you know what he really says? In a way, it's you. Or put it this way. He says, Mary. And he, by the way, he doesn't say, Miss Magdalene. Here's what's going on. Annie Dillard, in one of her Pulitzer Prize winning novelists, at one point Annie Dillard says, I'd been my whole life a bell, and I didn't know it until I was lifted up and rung, struck. There's no place in history uh, more than Western culture, more obsessed about identity. We're always trying to find out who we are. And, and the cultural narrative is you look inside and you decide who you are and then you assert it and you don't care what anybody else thinks. That's the cultural narrative and that's impossible because we're social beings and we're never going to have a secure identity just by looking inside and deciding who we want to be and then asserting it. Oh no. The way you get a secure identity is that someone you adore adores you. Someone that, that you respect respects you. Someone you love comes and loves you and affirms you. And what Jesus Christ is saying, I, the greatest being in the universe, I love you personally, expensively, and eternally. He says that to Mary. Mary. He reveals himself and reveals her to herself at the same time. He's really saying, I love you. I am not a dead founder of an ethical religion that you can somehow get to know by following my rules. I'm the living savior and you can know me. He says, don't hold on to me. What does that mean? He says, I'm, ba I'm about to leave. He says, you don't have to hold on to me as if you're afraid to lose me. I'm going to heaven and I'm gonna be at the right hand of God and I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit and then you will have me in a way you don't even have me now. You'll have me in a way that no one can ever remove me from you not even if they throw you into the darkest dungeon and the deepest dungeon. We'll be with together forever. And the more you know me and love me as the risen Lord, and the more you experience my love, the more you'll find out who you are, Mary. Look into the resurrection. Look at what it offers. Identity, grace. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for uh, giving us what we need to know, which is that your son rose from the dead and that we can know him personally, not just as a, a dead prophet or teacher, but as a living savior, and that we can hear his voice speaking to us, calling us by name, giving us his love. Lord, I pray for everybody hearing these words right now, you would give them that great gift. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this week's sermon. Please join us in praying for gospel renewal, both where you live and in New York City.